So, uh, last time I tried to convince you of a strange, strange point of view that programming is about bits. Uh, and of course, most of you think it was always self-evident. People always knew that. The amazing fact is that bits were not visible for many, many years. Bytes were invisible for decades. So that what we think is this abstract machine with which we are dealing was a long and rather convoluted process. And it took close to 30 years to f for for an abstract byte machine to emerge, right, to what I call a C machine model. And I think it's a very interesting story. So I want to talk a little bit about this emergence and how it interacted with things like programming languages. Uh, first of all, of course, when people build first computers, they were not even sure about beats at all. Uh, there was a clear understanding that the primary task was to deal with numbers. It wasn't even clear what kind of numbers, real numbers, integers, how to represent them. That was still somewhat in the dark. Uh, it was not clear at all how to represent integers. For example, as late as late, late 60s, when Knuth decides to write the art of computer programming, he refuses to commit himself to a binary mix machine, which is an amazing thing. You would think, I mean, what other kind of machine it could be? But he says, well, I want to, to keep all the doors open it could be either binary or decimal. That is, even somewhere around 1968 or 70, it was viewed as uncertain whether the machine should somehow deal with decimal integers. And not just Knut, uh, all microprocessors that were designed in the 70s, including the x86, Motorola 6800, all of them used to have uh, BCD instruction. So you could have uh, a binary coded decimal. Uh, you represent an integer as the decimal digits and operate on them. You add them, multiply them, etc. They had that in hardware. Uh, except you need to change tens. They have that, yes. So the x86 today still has those instructions. All of your computers you have, have to these be instructions. Uh, backward compatible, of course. Even today, Intel instruction set supports binary coded decimal. This is sort of the legacy of times long past. Right? So it was not clear how to represent integers. Moreover, when people talked about integers, right now, if you ask Jack, how long is an integer? Jack will scratch his head and say, well, it could be 32, it could be 64, right? That's what he would say. It was much harder. Because Jack sort of assumes that if somebody gives him an integer, it might be some kind of a power of two, right? Okay. Hopefully. It was not hopefully before. Nowhere close to that. I mean, a typical computer would have, well, if you were lucky, 36 bits. That was a very, very common word size, 36. We will see in a minute why it was so, so common. The greatest computer architect of all times, whom do I mean? The greatest computer architect. Very good, Seymour Cray. Obviously, the man of sort of astonishing genius uh, who could produce computers which will run faster than themselves. Uh, <laughs> As, well, after, since the Cray 6600, the fastest computer in the world, for as long as he lived, was one of his machines. 
since control data 6600. Wasn't it that was CDC 6600? Yeah, control data. It wasn't clear. Right, CDC was control data. Yes. Yeah. Right, so this is the guy who single handedly would time and time again defeat IBM. IBM, of course, always aspired to make the fastest computer. And there was this rural guy, he lived in Wisconsin, you know, in Chippewa Falls. For those of you who watched uh, uh, any hall, nobody knows? I knew knows, a couple of people. Any Hall is a very funny movie by Woody Allen. And uh, there is a segment of it, a few minute segment, takes place in Chippewa Falls. And it clearly shows that this is not Manhattan. Uh, it's one of the most rural and sort of remote and strange places. Watch it, you will know what I mean. Uh, but in any case, there's the guy from Chippewa Falls who was able to create the greatest computers for a very long time. If by greatest, you mean computers could do lots of things very, very fast. And of course, his word size was 60. As far as I know, not divisible by 8. Right? Uh, it took a very, very long time. Again, roughly speaking, only by around 1970, sort of powers of two, again, computers appear in 1945. It's a long time before powers of two. So integers were all kinds. They were maybe binary coded decimal. They were size 36. They could have been size 29. There were computers with 29. I mean, all, all kind. Right? There was absolutely no notion of byte whatsoever. Right? And if anything, a byte was how long? 10 bits? No. 6 bits? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but that's how you get it. I mean, by guessing is a wonderful thing. So, yes, 6 bits. I observed that I said that two very popular word sizes were 36 divisible by 6 and 60 divisible by, by 6. Why is 6 so very important? Number of digits in one hand? <laughs> yes, for some of us. <laughs> Observe that it's not quite. Find the number of digits in one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is enough to encode all English characters and uh, some other useful things. And of course, nobody in his right mind would need lowercase characters, right? So, six also postulated that all strings had to be uppercase. Because you have 64 possible characters. And you need at least 10 digits. Plus, you know, you need period, comma, whatever, some, some of these things. So no way you could have lowercase. So old people, people like who are old people? Like Paul, me. We remember all printouts were in upper case because there was no, I mean, it was, and it was understood by everyone that nobody needed lower case. Other languages? Other languages? What other languages? <laughs> you know, the, the idea of, it's actually, I come from a foreign country. I could see, see it now. Uh, but even in that country, uh, sort of most, most devices, at least by some point, were working in, in English. It, it was a total mess. In, in Russia, there was a total mess. Because of that, they never figured out. Uh, so, and in the United States, obviously, they knew there are no other languages. They still do. So uh, there was total disregard for, you know, Arabic? Uh, so, uh, 
it was very clear that that, that was enough for a long, long time, guys. That, that is very um, amazing thing. So six, six bit byte, even though, but it was not, of course, addressable. Again, all of us take it for granted that if you have a byte of some sort, you could somehow address it, like load it someplace in a variable, say. No, that was not at all common. Of course, people experimented. This was a wild age of experimentation. But it was not clear what would be right. For example, some people were even saying, well, we should have bit addressability. Every bit should have an address. It's not a bad idea. But it's too expensive, it so turned out. There was a very important computer, IBM Stretch, which allowed it. But it was very expensive. It was a great computer, but it was too expensive even for IBM to make many, many. So it, it, it sort of did not succeed. And then IBM, there was a very important thing which IBM decided to do. That, you know, IBM was a very great company. We will talk about even early IBM in a minute, but in the mid-60s, IBM came with a great, great idea of a unified computer architecture. Because prior to that, everybody knew, I'm building a computer of that size, and I'll design an instruction set just for it. If it's a big computer, it's going to have big word. Bigger the computer, the bigger the word size. That's how it was. Like the small computers would have like 18 bit word. Big computers would have 60 bit word. Makes perfect sense. Big computers are used by big people. Big people have big data. That is, they're physicists. They want lots of precision. Small computers are used by accountants, small people. So 18 bits is plenty. So there was this variety, and nobody tried to come up with an architecture. As a matter of fact, there was no word architecture. People didn't know. And then IBM came up with a great mind-boggling idea to come up with an architecture which could span the range from the lowest of the low. That wasn't quite the lowest of the low but literally all the way to the top. IBM never abandoned, IBM abandoned the architecture when going downwards, but it never abandoned that architecture going upwards. And there will be many computers from enormous, very expensive supercomputers all the way down to, to a tiny little thing, not tiny by today's standard, of course, I mean, but they would fit in this room, say. Refrigerate, yeah, refrigerator size. I think this is a very good, good description, right? So the management decided to do that. And then they decided to hire the best and the brightest and let them to design it. Again, we, we shall see IBM at that time, in spite of being, you know, fully dominated by free cash flow and all of that and being very successful, had this amazing idea of hiring truly the best and the brightest and letting them run the shop and do whatever was appropriate. And they designed an amazing architecture. It was IBM 360 series, which was, in some sense, again, I'm going to be hated by all the clever people out there. It was the greatest breakthrough in computer architecture ever because it was first, the first computer architecture. And then it introduced some very, very fundamental things, sort of this thing which you heard me mention, C machine model, was basically a result of that architecture. They introduced byte addressable memory. Remember sequence of bytes? That's what they introduced. They introduced fully blown pointers. That is, the, you could operate addresses really as if they were first class objects. It was, it was a remarkable thing. And they produced a, probably 
one of the great classics of computer architecture. It's not the classics of programming, but a classics of computer architecture called IBM Principles of Operation. And it was written by two remarkable people. Uh, one was Fred Brooks. Some of you might have heard of him. And then the second one was Gerrit Blau, however you pronounce his Dutch name. It's probably something like Blau, but uh, it's B-L-A-A-W. Uh, you at the end, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, they wrote this precise, beautiful, again, the idea at that time was, again, want to tell you it's something you need to know. It was considered that the good programmers should write great documentation. When I joined A9, I talked to one of our vice presidents and said, shouldn't we have something documented? I was referring to uh, the, the search engine. And the vice president, he moved since then to Seattle, uh, told me, uh, yes, we are going to hire a, a technical writer. IBM did not believe that in order to have great documentation, you should hire technical writers. It was considered to be a glorious task of the best programmers, computer scientists, computer designers to write this documentation. And they, they, they did a fabulous job. It's still, I think, an exemplary sort of. Uh, But uh, so that's one. Eventually, bytes start dominating because this work by IBM sort of shook the industry. Some companies decided just to clone IBM design. For example, RCA, which used to make a com computers, remote past, uh, designed uh, Spectre 70, which was their IBM clone. They literally said, IBM published this architecture. We're going just to implement it. Okay. Uh, sadly enough, they didn't implement it as one-to-one -one compatible. They, they made it slightly better, which was a big, big mistake. Never make something which is slightly better. Uh, ICL, there was a, at that time still a very re reputable British computer company. Uh, came up with System 4, their clone of IBM. Siemens, a German company, uh, came up with uh, their clone. And then, and here we're going to talk about high politics. Uh, the Soviet Politburo decided that the way of doing things is to cancel all computer design in Soviet Union and instead to produce 100% clone of IBM. Not like ICL, not like Siemens, but really 100%. And I think that they were ably assisted, I cannot prove it, but I'm pretty certain, by CIA, which delivered the manuals. That was a really great coup that stopped Soviet computer industry in its heels, and it never recovered. They were having a chance in early 60s. They had some really amazingly good designs. By the time they bought into this IBM uh, cloning, they were 20 years behind and never recovered. Stealing is not the best strategy for doing R&D. So, but whether you imitate IBM or not, everybody, even people who were designing the computers, woke up and started making byte-oriented computers. DEC, eventually Intel, eventually Motorola, everything which sort of realized that byte addressability is good. Suddenly, all these exotic Memory sizes, 36, 29, 40, they disappeared. So 
So IBM affected our worldview by, by enforcing, right? The problem which still remains, we need to, to, to sort of get back, is that there was this wonderful abstract machine emerging. And it had some problems, we shall see. Uh, but there was no access to it. What do I mean, no access? As late, okay, stories are always good. Yeah? So uh, in 1975, I had a conversation with a great Russian al algorithmic guy, uh, programmer, uh, Vladimir Arlazarov. Uh, he might be known to you, those of you who studied algorithms, because he did four Russian algorithms, four sort of matrix multiplication. For those who know about chess programming, Bert is not here, so. Uh, he was one of the leaders of CAISA, the World Chess Champion Program at that time. Brilliant man. And I was nobody, so there was a great man talking to a junior nobody. So. And he told me lots of things. First thing he told me, and that's the essential thing, uh, was that uh, nobody will ever use high-level languages to write important software. This the year was 1975. He still believed that in order to write an operating system, a database, a chess program, you have to program in assembly language because otherwise you just couldn't do things. Or it will be just so slow that nothing, nothing will happen. Uh, okay, I think he was wrong, at least now. But uh, by the way, the second piece of advice he, he gave me was that I shouldn't spend time on fundamental computer science. It is sort of over. And I should work on just application. Whether he was right or wrong, I think I did all right. Uh, so. Uh, don't listen to old people. <laughs> Something about cretins. A cretin says all cretins are liars. An old person says don't listen to old people. Uh, whatever. Uh, okay, so. How could you access this machine? And let us look at the sort of the idea of a programming language. And in order to understand how programming languages came about, we have to go back again to IBM. And let me tell you again, it was a remarkable, it was a great company. Every time I go back, in history and think about all these great things which were done, I admire their management. So in 1953, a rather young programmer writes a memo to IBM management saying that we need to design a system which will do formula translation. He didn't use the word high-level language because there was no such word. There were no programming language. It's the year is 1953. At the time, how many computers are there? No. Much more. 1953. We're not talking 45. But 200. But nevertheless, it is almost four. You're right. It's a very small number. So why would you even bother doing anything for them? They have to do due diligence. So what do they do? By the way, anybody knows what's the name of this young programmer? John Backus. That's the name. So John, John Backus writes it. And by the way, why does he want to do it? What's, what's his motivation? He told his motivation at the end of the 70s in an interview.
what he said, and that's the only thing which could guide us. He said, I was very lazy, and I hated to write code. Therefore, said, I mean, I'm just telling you what John, I mean, he was a remarkable guy. He was a very close friend of Paul over there. So if you want to know many things about, about John, you could ask Paul. I knew him a little bit, and he was indeed a very remarkable man. So uh, in 1953, he comes with this idea, writes a memo. And due diligence, they're, they're just bean counters. And the guy's asking actually for major resource, for a big team. By the standards of that time, enormous team, something like 10 people, 10 programmers. This is like, you know, 1% of all programmers in the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, but finding programmers were extremely hard. Where do you get programmers in 1953, right? And he asked for top programmers and many of them to do this. So they apparently hire a consultant. And this is 1953, if you want to find out what is good and what is not about computers, who is the best consultant? 1953. Just pick a great name from 1953. It's easy. What's the great, who invented computers? Von Neumann, exactly, good. So you call for Neumann and say, Johnny, come over. And he does. That's IBM. You don't say no to IBM. So for Neumann comes, listens to the presentation. What does he say? He says, the stupidest idea ever. Why would you waste a valuable computer time on a menial task which girls could do quickly? Because the, the idea there then was that there would be two, the still very sexist society. So you would have men who come up with like mathematical solutions. And then there would be these coders, usually female, and there were actually official explanations that women are better for that. They're more careful, sort of, and they would translate it into code. So why would you replace five girls with a very expensive computer? Right? So von Neumann was totally, again, you know, we have to take the attitude at the time the way they were. So, and they did call them girls then, believe it or not. Huh? I was there. I remember. So uh, I actually was there, but I do not remember. Uh, I was fairly young. But uh, Paul, of course, remembers. He was a year old. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, for Neumann, says a very stupid idea. What does idea management do? This is an amazing thing. They say, go ahead. They give him 10 apparently brilliant people. I, I do not know any of them. They, their names are known. By the way, the history of Fortran development is brilliantly documented by Paul at Computer Museum Software Preservation Society, all the original members. Paul is one of the originators of computer history as a discipline. And he did this fabulous job on history of Fortran. And he should be giving this lecture, not me, but Brian wouldn't trust him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, he's not employed by a nine uh, and could divulge some secrets, so I don't know what. Uh, so uh, they go and start working on it. They don't know anything. They have to write a compiler. By the way, there is no term compiler. They have to invent everything, and they do. You know, they, they invented, like, if you look at modern compilers, all the basic stuff. Like, the, what is the most basic notion in a compiler? Oh, you're not compiler people. The notion of basic block, BB. When you talk to compiler people, you just, what is basic block? It's a block which does computation with one entry, one exit. It appears in these papers which Paul collected. In like 54, they figured out that you have to decompose things in basic block. 
They do fabulous job, guys. This is something which these, these people realized. And you, you have to understand also that it's very, very funny because John Beck is, is happy go lucky guy with no business interest. Any business interest? Did he ever care about business interest? He came from a rich family. He already had money. So he didn't care about free cash flow. Right? So he was, but he came up with an idea which no other computer scientist would have come at that time and wouldn't come for many, many years after. He realized that unless this thing produces really fast code, it is going to be a failure. That is, he wanted to produce a compiler which would be as fast is handwritten code, right? What we would call, yes? Did COBOL produce any fast code? COBOL did not produce anything like that. It COBOL was much, much later, okay? The first COBOL compiler appears in 58, uh, 59. And the first Fortran optimizing compiler comes out in 57. You say, it's just two years. This is eternity. That is, there was a proof what they did while people are yucking and talking about formula translation. Here comes, it took them four years. And, but by the way, but they do it by the book. They write f specification documents. And I'm not, I mean, Paul now saved all of that. You could go there and read their full specification, then they come up with a manual. They write a very good manual, by the way, a very, very good manual, before they ship. Guys, think about it. Before they ship, long before they ship. How long? A year before they ship. So people could start learning this stuff a year before they ship. Right? And then they ship a compiler, and from day one, it generates better code than most programmers. Of course, uh, there will always will be, you know, corner cases where, you know, a you know, ace programmer would outperform. But first Fortran, just Fortran, not Fortran 77, but Fortran, was generating amazingly robust code and extremely efficient code. And then what happened was that all the physicists embraced it. Yes? No. No. The notion of bootstrapping, and couldn't be. We will see bootstrapping didn't even come close. Nobody cared about that. So that was not, that was not anything they would even be interested in. Uh, and of course, compiler was not portable. Again, the notion of portability was not there. To a great degree, the notion of portability was the result of Fortran success. If it were not, Fortran invented portability. Because in 1957 comes this compiler, which runs, of course, only on IBM. Why would it run? I mean, and it, it ran on what? 704, right? And only on 704. Other IBM things wouldn't run it. They, they, they were not going to, I mean, that was the, the mainframe, the main computer, sorry, right? But then other guys wake up and say, ah, but it's not machine specific. They didn't know how to. So we could somehow do that and sell it to the same physicists. So the notion of portable software comes from Fortran. And for decades, it remains an exclusive property of Fortran. There were no other portable software from whatever, late 50s till well into the 70s other than, other than Fortran. Physicists reached the state of bliss. They could sort of move from computer to computer and stuff would run. It, it was a remarkable breakthrough. Sort of the invention of Fortran 
again, we, we're, we're all sort of conditioned to think. Uh, this is a typical view of uh, computer scientists, basically from very early on, from the 60s, that oh, Fortran is a hoarded language. No, Fortran was the greatest language ever designed. They esteemed it the by far greater thing that literally all of the, re I mean, rest, rest of the people combined. It was maligned by all the greats, for example, you know, obviously, Dijkstra wrote some very nasty things about Fortran and Bacchus. Obviously, Tony Hoare wrote some nasty things about Fortran and Bacchus. That was, that was, even back then, it was considered to be like normal to go and insult. I mean, we still do it. Uh, you know, I do it all the time, but Scott Myers, right? Uh, but they were insulting somebody who actually founded the field, the guy who invented programming languages. And uh, sort of, I, I would like to just make my statement that Fortran was a very great achievement and, and remains so. We will, we will go back to Fortran th throughout the course. Of course, I mean, it, there were many flaws that we can now look at, but programming language theory was non-existent. Uh, language, all of the you know grammar stuff was non-existent. This was before all of that, and so they really came up with the basic notions that we still use. And yes, it was imperfect in many ways, but that, that I mean that doesn't mean anything. It, it was wildly successful, much more successful than anything that these other people did. Right? People still run Fortran. Physicists still use Fortran. They have absolutely no plans to switch to Scholar. Scala, whatever. <laughs> huh? they, they are very happy. Sort of, you could go and talk to them about, oh, C++ allows you generic program, and they nod their heads and go back to their fortune. Why? Because they can solve their problems very efficiently. So why should they consider something else? So, again, it's not... And in many respects, we need to understand the success of Fortran to see, to, to understand what, what we do. We will be looking at Fortran. Uh, to, uh, but now I'm in a predicament. I need to start talking about something else, and we have three minutes before lunch. Uh, guys, enjoy. <laughs>